Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, October 1st, 2020. This is the week in charts. I'm sure I thank all you guys and girls for being here. We continue to break records at night. That's great. Everybody's finding a show. If you're watching on YouTube, you can't find a live show, go to DaveLander.com. Usually on Thursdays, of course, but if you scroll down on the homepage, there's also a place to register. And if you do register and you can't get in, please let me know. I think we worked out those bucks. So what are we talking about? Well, obviously, current market conditions. I have a lot to say about that. Your questions on trading, if you don't mind, keep them relative to, to the slides while we're on the slides, just so my ADD doesn't kick in. Then you can ask about anything you want. For your stock picks, ask about one pick at a time and then hit return. And if you don't mind, there too, for your benefit, so don't get deleted accidentally. Wait until we get to the live charts. So what are we going to focus on? Well, I was thinking when I came into this week, it's like, okay, well, I know what I'm going to do this week because we started working on those trading problems last week. And there were a plethora of them, and we got through quite a few, but there's still quite a few more. And then I woke up thinking, maybe I need to rewind things a little bit and figure out a way to solve those problems before they occur. And I think I, I, think I have a way of doing that, or at least introducing you to ways to do that. And that'll make sense in just one second. Before we do all that, there's a disclaimer screen as I often preach all predictions about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. I borrowed that from my buddy Greg Morris. Now, just in case you didn't see last week's or you're not a gold member of DaveLander.com, last week we talked about this silly little banner ad I got on a website, obviously, tongue in cheek, me being a wizard, right? And if I could wave a magic wand and solve one of your trading problems, what would it be? And that comes from, uh, I actually picked it up at a graduation speech for my daughter. And it's along those lines, a lot of motivational type of people talk about that. And if you think about it, a lot of your problems really just are an expense, okay? Provided you're, you're making good money and you got a little problem and you want to solve it, it's like, you know, I could just spend a little money and fix that problem. I got an old clunky printer that was inherited from my wife's business in here. It's a piece of crap, you know, and and I kick it and slam it and kick it and, and uh, kick it twice. <laughs> back when back when I was in computers uh, in my MIT days, we said, uh, if we could get rid of users and printers, our lives would get a lot easier. Anyway, long story endless, I clicked uh, two clicks, maybe even one click nowadays with the way Amazon works. And for 150 bucks, I had a new printer, you know, and it works great. It's fine. So sometimes it's not really a problem. It's just an expense and aggravations can be solved. Well, in trading, believe it or not, a lot of times the solution is simple. It's not easy, though. And that's what I'll, I don't want, want to make light of anything, but it's, it's not always that easy. But from the outside, especially if you're not in an actual trade, the solution looks really simple. So tonight we're going to talk about solving your trading problems before they occur. Now, as I said last week, after going through all these trading problems and, and picking the ones that I want to cover last week, and then we'll probably pick up on these again next week because there's so many of them. And we have covered them already in details, and I'll show you where some of them at least, and I'll show you those in just one second. But like I said last week, as you go through the trading psychology or the mindset, you'll realize there's some overlap with the money management and the holistic traders, a bit of an overlap with all three of them. And as I said again last week, when I took a course on how to put together courses, <laughs> that's just the way I operate. That's the way I roll. For my members area, it said, hey, divide everything into three separate areas. I'm like, that's easy. Mindset, money management, and methodology. Well, sometimes I get caught up in talking about the money management, and it's really more of a psychology speech. And as I've said before, people have asked me, is the money management psychological or statistical? My answer is yes. And without going into a lot of details on that, there's a lot of different aspects of my money management. In order to get in and get the swing trade profit, it gives you that instant gratification. And then possibly a longer term trade, a longer term trend trade, gives you that longer term self actualization. And then some realization of that through obviously 
large gains when they do occur. And after working with all three of these, I said, well, I need to have a fourth one, which is the holistic trader, which is a little bit of both. Now, as I said last week and weeks prior, we occasionally do Q&As, although it's been a while since we've done any because the Facebook group has been doing a fantastic job of getting a lot of questions answered. So a lot of the stuff that I'm answering in recent presentations has been left over along with a few newer trading problems that have occurred from people who aren't in the system or aren't gold members or service members. But anyway, a lot of these things have been covered in a lot of detail. So if you become a member of DaveLander.com or if you already are a member, just go to the Q&A sessions and it's very reasonable, $47 a month and you get a lot of stuff plus you get access to the Facebook group. So before we talk about the trading problems or let me rewind that group, let's put the trading problems on hold a little bit and let's let's back things up a little bit to figure out a way to possibly stop a lot of those trading problems long before they occur. Now, the reason technical analysis works is because the market participants often behave in an irrational manner. As I've said ad nauseum, Yogi Berra once said, if the world were perfect, it wouldn't be. Well, my corollary to that as it, come, as it relates to the markets is, if the market wasn't emotional, it wouldn't be. And a lot of reading I've been doing lately, a lot of Darvis and quite a few others, they talk about how each stock has a personality and it does. And that personality is based on the personalities of the people who trade that stock. Now, here's the tricky part. And as Linda Rasky said very eloquently in her book, Trading Sardines, right when you figure out the lock, they change the key. So you, you, get your, you wrap your head around some of these little go-go stocks that the Robin Hood traders have been trading, and then they kind of wash out a little bit and newer players come in or those stocks mature, and then they end up with a little bit of a different audience. So if the market wasn't emotional, it wouldn't be. So you're dealing with an emotional being, so to speak, and it's made up of a lot of emotional beings. And a lot of this, a lot of these slides tonight come straight from Trading Full Circle, which is available as a premium course. You can buy it, of course, if you want to. I'd love for you to buy it, or just become a member of DaveLander.com, a gold member, and you'll eventually get it for free as a thank you for sticking around. But the point I'm trying to make here is that it's made up, the market that is, of a bunch of emotional beings, and you two are one of those beings. So you have to be cognizant of your own feelings. And the best way to do that is be cognizant of your feelings in life. And that's something that I've done ever since I started learning a little bit about how this neurology thing works especially as it relates to trading. And I'm just kind of touch on that very briefly in a few seconds. But ask yourself, how do you feel about things? And then after a while, just kind of do it second nature, whether it be a lunch decision, uh, a decision or a, a heated debate with your spouse or significant other. And by the way, if you have both, you probably shouldn't be trading. You probably have enough things to worry about. So, uh, <laughs> Anyway, so if you could be cognizant of your emotions when you're trading, not try to eliminate them, but be cognizant of them, it's going to have you wrap your head around the emotional nature of the market. And one thing that I have done in more recent years is try to make that little pause, especially if I find myself wanting to make an impulsive trade. And if I could stop myself from making that impulsive trade, something off the cuff, or something like micromanaging, not following the plan in general, and a host of other potentially bad behaviors, getting sucked in by the flickering ticks. I think that's a Todd Harrison quote. And just basically anything off the cuff, anything I should be doing. And if I say, wait a minute, Dave, let me just count to three. And then I find those emotions come down quite a bit. One thing I've noticed in more recent times 
is it seems like whenever I leave my office, as soon as I come back, it seems like there's a trade on the screen. And it can't it can't be that much of a coincidence. Every time I leave the office, I'm talking like, talk about go in the house, make a sandwich or whatever, or whatever. <laughs> Low carbonate lately, so not too many sandwiches, but you get the idea. Come back in, it's like, wow, there's immediately a trade. It's not always immediately a trade. So I've got to come in, catch my breath, relax for a minute, and then realize that maybe I was being a little emotional. And when that does occur, as it does very often, and because I'm a very emotional guy, as I often say, when forced to watch a Nicholas Sparks movie, I cry like a schoolgirl. <laughs> so just be cognizant of those, those emotions, and that's going to help you to wrap your head around the emotional nature of the overall market. I was thinking earlier, right before we went live, it's like my brother-in-law, as I've said quite a few times lately, I get a little story and then I just kind of beat it to death for a while, but it's such a good story. At least I think it is. For the last 20 something years at Thanksgiving and Christmas and whenever we all get together, sometimes or usually we always end up with a, talking about the market at some point in time. And he's involved with some certain particular companies and he knows the technology of some other uh, companies being the salesman. And he'll get into this, well, these guys got this product and this is great. And these guys are going to have good earnings. And, you know, and I keep trying to tell him it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And it's like Groundhog Day every time we have one of these family gatherings. And then last time I saw him, he's like, I get it. I'm like, what do you mean you get it? He goes, well, I, I, I tried a little stint at day trading. I had some spare time in the morning on my hands based on what I was doing and COVID and everything night and uh, COVID-19 and everything else. So I figured I would day trade for a couple hours every day. And it's like, it is just nothing but emotions and there's no rhyme or reason to it. I'm like, amen. It's either going up, down or sideways. I have a little, well, you won't be able to see it. As I show you the instructions, I have printed on my arm in case I lose my way. So old Wall Street adage, which is very, very true. You're trading traders, not markets. So in borrowing a line from Tom McClellan, anytime you buy a stock, you're what's of more concern to you than the actual company is anyone who has bought that company prior to you and quoting Tom, he said, and those people will screw you. He spoke at the APTA convention, American Association of Professional Technical Analyst, Analyst Meeting back, oh, that was a few years back, back in New Orleans. And it was a really good speech. And along those lines, something to wrap your head around is all it takes is one a-hole to screw up a perfectly good trade. And as I meet traders throughout my little trader's journey here that I've been on for a, quite a while, I'll discover people are doing things that are much different than I do. And uh, I like to get in these TKO type of setups where hopefully the market goes parabolic. And then all of a sudden, sometimes these parabolic markets crash and take me out with them. And then I realize that when I spoke to a group of day traders a few years back, that they're actually shorting the parabolics. That's an actual, actual strategy for them. So I said, you know, after I showed this slide, I'm like, hey, it's nice to meet you. <laughs> so again, all it takes is one a-hole screw up a perfectly tr good trade. Now, the other thing that, let's not forget, we talked about solving problems ahead of time, and that would be to obsess before you get into a trade and not afterwards. I learned very early on in my computer science days that garbage in creates garbage out. And as I've said quite a bit, Papa John would probably make a pretty good trader. Better ingredients, better pizza. So if you do better analysis going in, is it truly in a trend? And I'm going to bring up a few other things here in just a few minutes. And does the stock trade cleanly? And is it a Nice little setup is pull back. And can you qualify it, not quantify it, but qualify it with certain things, such as the Landry light? Then maybe it's a trade worth taking. Now, one thing that is kind of amazing to me is if you get better 
with one little piece, whether it be trading psychology or mind or methodology of the money management, it strengthens that three-stranded cord, and three strands being mind, methodology, and money management. So if you get better at picking your stocks, then you're going to feel better because you're catching more winners, which makes you more likely to follow the plan, which occasionally means kicking a loser out of a portfolio. When I'm doing really well and I've got five or six stocks that are doing incredibly well in my portfolio and I got one that's not doing so well, I'm like, okay, your days are numbered. I'm not going to just kick you out willy nilly, but if you hit the stop or when you hit the stop, you will be taken out. And you're much more likely to do that once you know what a good looking winner looks like. So what does that mean? Allowing yourself to get stopped out of a losing trade. Well, that means that you're following the money management plan. And in following the money management plan, you're going to end up with more winners in your portfolio. As I've said before, I do a little John Adams. What's his name? Paul Giamatti. I like Paul Giamatti. He's funny as heck. And he did John Adams, which I haven't watched yet. I don't know if it's good or not, so don't spoil it for me. But anyway, I did see the clip where he said, I said good day, sir. So I, I tend to say that very loudly when my trade stop out. My soundproofing did not work in my office, by the way. My wife said she can hear me playing as day in here, and I can hear her <laughs> next door in the bedroom, the bathroom. So it just didn't work out as planned. But um, that's a story for another day. But she... This weird noise is coming out of this office, <laughs> especially if I'm doing a presentation, but many other times too. But anyway, you're more likely to kick that stock out of your portfolio. So what's going to happen? What happens when that happens? You're catching more winners. You're kicking out more losers. You're making more money. You're feeling good about yourself. You begin to feel better about the methodology. And so your methodology is improving. And then it makes you better at recognizing greatness. So you can see how it's all intertwined, pun intended. So what I'm doing here is kind of going all the way back to the beginning a little bit and kind of getting back to that basic trading psychology. And as I'm going live tonight, I'm like, am I going too basic with all this? And the answer is no. Because most of your problems can be solved with just kind of like getting back to the basics. And to my surprise, when I asked about trading problems, a couple of traders who I have a lot of respect for, who've been with me for 10 years, maybe longer, they put in some problems and we're all human. We're all emotional. Okay. We all make mistakes. We all have trading problems. But to my surprise, they put in some very basic problems and it's like, okay, well, that's a fairly easy fix, okay? Actually doing it, eh, not so easy, but we'll touch upon a few of those things in just one second. So my definition of technical analysis is reading the emotions of the market participants, okay? Are people excited about the market? Is the market generally headed higher? Is the market chopping around, okay? Creating overhead supply or support below, whatever the case may be. Is a stock trending? Has it pulled back and likely to continue its trend? So you have to read the mind of the market participants, more importantly, the emotions of the market participants, while at the same time embracing your own. Now, we're going to talk about perception here in just one second, and that is a big problem when it comes to trading. We end up with this selective perception and perceptual distortion. Not enough time to get into all of the details on perception, we're just gonna to touch upon in a few seconds here. But when I was putting together this presentation, the last minute I found an entire presentation just on pre uh, perception and the importance of understanding that perceptual distortion and the selective perception, which can be very dangerous. And we do this a lot in life too. We have selective perception and perceptual distortion. And I think it's good to wrap your head around that in life too. But anyway, remember that we are these emotional creatures. And I was doing some writing last night. Remember the Geico commercial, so easy, even a caveman could do it. I guess that would come across racist now because uh, it, it's obvious like the, you know, <laughs> it's making fun of the caveman. But anyway, the, the preppy caveman with a tennis racket sees the, in the goofy looking caveman, you know, doing like this with a club in his hand. So easy, even a caveman could do it, switching to Geico insurance. Well, 
the irony in all that is we do have a lot of that caveman mentality. The brain did not keep up with evolution at all. I mean, think of how fast things are moving. What's the what's the law? Not Ohm's law, but there's a there's, it's a law in semiconductors where and if somebody knows it, let me know. Every every so many years, the circuit board doubles in size as for or or halves in size as far as the amount of semiconductors that could be placed on a chip. So that's moving incredibly fast. Our our brain evolution is not keeping up with that. Now, every decision we make has emotions and stress involved, as I often say, even what you're gonna have for lunch. Okay, like last Thursday, I was I was saying, geez, I really wanna have a couple of beers after these presentations, my throat's real dry, I like to relax and come down. It's like, no, I'm gonna be tired tomorrow. So now I'm faced with that emotional decision tonight and I might cave in. <laughs> but we'll see. So every decision, even if you're going to have for lunch, whether you not have a beer or not tonight, has a stress and consequence associated. Our neurology does not allow us to make decisions without a stress or a emotion in a consequence. So it's all in your head. One thing I was thinking about is you really have to become consciously competent. And there's a, I think it's a Dunning Cougar effect, especially like what a lot of these little Robin Hood people. It's like, you know, I'm glad you're, I'm glad you're trading. And I think that Robin Hood's a very positive thing. It's gotten some of the middle-aged wives involved, like friends, uh, my friends' wives are now trading and stuff. And hey, look at me, I made all this money. I'm like, okay, well, come back in a few months and let's see how you did. And kind of like the man in the street and just people in that I run into in business and through building the house and all, you know, one guy was like, Hey, I made 40% last month. Is that good? You know, it's like, well, he ran his account from a thousand dollars to 1400. I'm like, yeah, that's fantastic. You know, if you could do that every week, 40% every week, or was 40% a month, I forget the math, but I showed the math a while back, you know, he'd be worth 10 million at the end of the year and then a hundred million within five years or something like that. And, you know, I love you guys and girls a lot, but if I could do 40% a month, you'd probably never see my fat ass again, at least maybe about a year from now or so, as I often say. So the problem is you don't know that you're consciously competent, especially if you've had a lot of early success. So you really need to know what you're doing, and then you really know what you don't. The most humbling thing about this business is the longer you're in it, the real, uh, you realize the less you know, kind of reminds me of, of Seinfeld. It's like, what's it about? It's about nothing, you know, what happens? Nothing, you know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like that equated to trading. It's like you you have no control over the market. You can control yourself, okay? Provided you embrace your emotions, but you have no control over the market. You don't know for sure what the market's gonna do. A lot of curves are gonna be thrown at you. But if you're new to trading and you're just kind of all of a sudden knock it out of the park and you got really lucky, you hit it at the right time, the right place at the right time, and you don't recognize you're in the right place at the right time, then it's like it's going to be really tough when when the reality does set in. And by the way, just got not to get sidetracked. Imagine that and you get sidetracked. The people who do the best in trading longer term, and I've seen a couple of these famous people talk about this. It's a, the initial success isn't necessarily a, a precursor of your longer term success. The people I see do the best come in when the service is kind of mediocre. We win a few, we lose a few, we chop around, we chop around, we chop around, we don't do a whole lot. And then we start printing money for a while because at that point their expectations are tempered. The worst thing can happen to someone, and I, I picked on this gentleman last week, because he said that he was going to quit my trading service so he could sell puts so he could sleep easier at night. And it's like, well, the market was going straight up. You know, you could sell puts when the market's going straight up. And guess what? Every day you wake up, you're a little bit richer, a little bit richer, a little bit richer until the one day you wake up, the market crashes and your accounts wiped out. And psychologically, that's a very tough place to be. So you have to know what you don't know. And that's kind of hard, but over time you'll discover that. You get your ass handed to you a few times and you're like, oh, wait a minute. Sometimes you actually lose money in this trading thing. And then again, just realize the buying, the money management and the methodology are all 
intertwine. As I often say, money management will cure a multitude of sins. I was cleaning out my slides from last week, and I noticed that a lot of the problems, so to speak, don't you hate people who use a little air quotes? <laughs> a lot of problems were basically not honoring a stop. Well, how do you fix that problem? Well, honor your stop, put in a hard stop, okay? Micromanagement, something I see all over all over all the time. Don't micromanage. I know, easier said than done. Now, one thing I would encourage you to do, either if you're new to trading or if you if you lost your way, okay? It's like when I go through a drawdown, I think, you know, maybe I need to just get back to doing one little simple thing and trade one little pattern until I get better at it. Years ago, I knew a trader. Now he was more of a day trader type, and and this thing this thing would not work in today's market. So it doesn't matter whether I share it with you or not, and I'm not going to mention it. But whenever he would get into a bit of a rush, he would go back to the first thing that he ever did as a trader. He had a little tape reading type of system that he used, which no longer works. Believe me, it doesn't. But he would go back to that, and he would kind of hit a few singles and start making money again, and then he would go back to doing all the other things that he did trade the other 10 patterns or whatever you trade it. But I would encourage you to specialize, especially at first, or if you lost your way. As I've said quite a bit, Bruce Lee once said, I fear not the man who has practiced 10,000 kicks once, but I fear the man who has practiced one kick 10,000 times. And Linda Rasky said, all you need is one pattern to be successful. So originally this slide again came from trading full circle, like many of the ones tonight. And on the slide, it said, master something like the TKO, and ideally a TKO with a persistent trend or persistent pullback or generic pullbacks first. And then uh, tonight, because I think it's a easy to recognize pattern, possibly even easier than those other things, which to me seems pretty obvious, but I can see where a newbie might want something that's a little bit more, I hate to use the word quantifiable because I don't want to, get into like a purely mechanical sense, but it's easier to qualify and of course recognize, as I've said quite a bit, I was shocked at how popular the bow ties became. I just I just kind of put it out there like, hey, this is a little pattern I trade, moving averages cross over. It's really good for tops. It's really good for bottoms to catch, not to try to catch a top, but to catch the first little rollover after a major top is in place or first little rally after a major, bo major bottom is in place. And it really caught on because they're very easy to recognize. So I think the Landry light pullbacks can be an, another one of those type of things. Now, one thing I've been thinking about a lot is there's only two questions that you ever need to ask yourself on every trade. Number one, will there be a greater fool? So the way you make money in the markets is you're betting that the stock or the currency or the cryptocurrency or whatever else you're trading, the hard asset or the commodity, you're betting that someone, if you're buying it, you're betting that someone is going to value that higher in the future, okay? In uh, very plain speak and in layman's terms, you're counting on a greater fool someone that's going to be foolish enough to buy that at a much higher price from you okay so there's only two questions you have to ask yourself will there be a greater fool and i think this is a more important question am i the greater fool how many times have you ever bought the top of a market raise your hand i think everybody here based on the faces i recognize has probably bought the exact top of the market. Now, I got to thinking about it, and maybe there's only one question you need to ask. You know me, I believe in trying to simplify things and reduce them down to their utmost essence. And in doing that, I think there's only one question that you ever need to ask yourself on any given trade other than is it trending is it pullback is it set up is there sexy sisters or brothers 
depending on what you're into. And I guess if you're into both, you're a greedy bastard. That's a uh, Dennis Miller <laughs> stole that from him. But of course, all the other questions you have to ask, but before you actually click into a trade, the only question you have, the only one question you need to ask yourself is, am I the greater fool? Are you possibly buying that from someone who's unloading it? And just think about it. Now, markets are really based on perception. In fact, life is based on perception look at all the mess going happening in the united states and everybody seems to have a different way of perceiving it at this juncture now i grabbed this definition from a, a prior presentation and i like the second definition is to interpret or look on someone or something in a particular way and I think that's a really good definition when it comes to trading. So let's say you are long a stock and this is what the stock looks like. And then it has a little bit of a rally, okay? So you see that little bit of a rally and what is happening in your head? You're seeing that big blue arrow pointing up or a bottom, okay? Now let's say that you are short a market, just the opposite, and the big blue arrow is pointing higher, and that market has a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of a dip, actually a bullish pullback, right? What are you going to see? You're going to see a big blue arrow pointing down. G.C. Selden has a great quote here. He wrote, do I have it here? It's a little book, it's about this thick. You could actually get it for free. I went ahead and bought a, a real copy. I got a two or three of them laying around my office and I've read it and reread it several times. I recently reread it again. You could read it in one sitting. And I think it was written in 1912. And it's amazing the things that he said in that book are just as true today as they were back, it, back then. And he actually talked a little bit about the neurology of how our brains haven't kept up with evolution which i thought was pretty amazing one of the greatest difficulties encountered by the active trader is that of keeping his mind in a balanced and unprejudiced condition when he is heavily committed to either the long or the short side of the market unconsciously to himself and that's a biggie right there unconsciously to himself he permits his judgment to be swayed by his hopes. That's G.C. Selden from The Psychology of the Stock Market. Okay, let's say that you are out of the market. Let's say you got knocked out of the market and you take it a little break because it's like, okay, well, you know, the heck with this market. And uh, what's the market start doing? It's going straight up, okay? Go back to earlier this year, we had the, we're all gonna die, right? Well, now only half is gonna die, you know? I'm not making light of the situation, but you get the idea, you know? <laughs> you guys, you traders out here, you have thick skin, you can handle it. So you're out of the market, got knocked out or whatever, and then the market's going straight up. I've got friends with their, their 401ks, okay? And it's like they held on, held on, held on, held on, and they finally just gave up. And then of course the market goes straight up and then they're like, no, I'm not getting back in. So if you're out of the market, you might perceive that market as just not getting anywhere or worse, getting ready to head lower. So that's your perception. Now, let's say you're losing money, you're in a drawdown and you're feeling pretty bad because all your hard earned cash or some of your hard earned cash, I should say, but you're losing quite a bit. And you see the mother of all setups, something that looks like this. We're actually going to talk about this particular setup in just one second. Well, what are you going to see in your mind? You're going to see a stock that, up. Oh, that looks like it's rolling over. I wouldn't touch that with a 10-foot pole. Or you might not even see the pattern itself. It might not jump out at you because you're prejudiced for feeling like 
you're, you're afraid to put capital in the harm's way. So that could really change your perception. Now, let's say you're printing money and then you see a mediocre setup, something that's kind of Jackie Mason, it's up, it's down, it's up, it's down. All of a sudden in your head, you might see this beautiful setup. And this is something I'm trying to wrap my head around. And I actually got a few answers on this over the years, one in particular from a, from a psychiatrist who emailed me back and I couldn't understand why people who are very successful in other careers fail so miserably often as traders and they try to see something that doesn't exist. They see a chart that looks like the one in this dude's head and in reality is it looks like the chart on the right. And she explained to me that you can't, if you're a doctor or a lawyer or automatic transmission mechanic, you can't sit around and wait and wait and wait and wait and wait for the perfect client. You have to take what comes along. And that's why any highly trained or skilled individual can't sit around and wait. It's very hard for them to sit around and wait for the perfect trade. It's funny, my, I have a mechanic I absolutely love, sweet little old man. And <laughs> he had a car that he kept running for like 10 years. It was a piece of junk. And he was finally happy to see it leave his uh, premise. His, his, it was it belonged to like his cousin or something. So his cousin said, hey, can, we, can I leave that car here? <laughs> and uh, could you... Uh, just, you know, when the guy comes, you know, take the money or whatever from him and, and uh, give him the car. He's like, sure, no problem. Well, the guy took the money, literally drove it out of the parking lot and drove it back into the other side and dropped off the keys and said, hey, could you uh, could you fix a few things for him? Anyway, so where am I going with that? Well, he can't sit around and wait for the perfect car, okay? Or he can't turn down that car because it's not a perfect car. And that's just one of many examples I'm sure you guys in other professions could chime in on. Mark Douglas, the late great Mark Douglas. I spoke with Douglas once on the phone. We were supposed to do some sort of project together. I don't even remember what the project is at this point in time. And unfortunately nothing transpired and let's transpire. And he's no longer with us. And he's he's one of the good guys. He's one of the good ones. And he, he was I think he was playing like an uh, adult hockey league or something. Came home, wasn't feeling good and that was the end of him, poor guy. We're not perceiving the market, but only the unique market in our minds based on the distinctions we have learned up until this moment in time. The market has no control over you, over how you behave or respond to it. It's all in your head. And if you've been to, to some of these presentations before, I asked, you know, how stressful was that cocoa bear market in, I think it was 2016, I forget exactly when, well, the commodity like went down more than half and that's huge. That's huge. Like my hands are not tiny, it's huge. <laughs> went down just an incredible amount. And I've given the presentation several times, even in person. And that one person was stressed out about that. Well, because cocoa is, is kind of a thin market and I haven't met a whole lot of cocoa traders in my, my, my time. I don't think I've ever made a dime in cocoa, by the way. The other thing I woke up thinking about today, and it's kind of along the lines of, and I've beat the dead horse on this, poor Mr. Sakota. I actually have been quoted as, as saying this now. It's kind of like I used to say a lot of Linda Rasky quotes, you know, ask a six-year-old kid. And I said it so many times, I started getting quoted on that. You know, I was like, no, it's Linda. And then the intuition versus the intuition. And every presentation, I think, I'm gonna try not to put that in a presentation. And I woke up this morning and think, oh, it's okay, I've got a great idea. It's a must-take trade or a mistake trade. <laughs> and then of course, I somewhere in here, I think I worked in the intuition versus intuition. Now for a must-take trade, I, I beat the dead horse on the post-mortem and you're gonna see quite a few post-mortems here today, not to be confused with Post Malone. I actually had my Post Malone shirt on today. Anyway, that's an inside joke, but the, the must take trade, how do you know if it's a must take trade? Well, you have to be careful of all that perception. If you've been losing money lately, or recently I should say, 
it's going to be hard to recognize that opportunity because you're going to be a little gun shy, like we just showed a few minutes ago. But if you could look at the trade and try to detach yourself, what psychologists call it, um, what do they have a word for it? I can't think of it. Larry Williams had a quote about it. But you're you're basically detached from from the trade. So if you could detach yourself from it and do a little imaginary time traveling in your head and say, if I take this trade and it stops out, how am I going to feel? Well, if you feel like, eh, so what? It looks fantastic. I would take it again tomorrow. And I'm going to show you one in a few minutes where I actually said that this thing looks fantastic and I actually went back and listened to the tape. Listen, I hold it on the tape. But the other thing you could do, like I said, is time travel in the future, see how you would feel. So that's kind of like the, the pre-mortem, like how will you feel in the future? And I was looking at some presentations earlier tonight, and one of them I talked about mind sculpting. Ian Robinson, I think, uh, talked about that. sculpting is what I tried to say a second ago, where you're kind of doing that time travel thing. So I call that the pre-mortem. Now, there's that intuition thing again. It's If it's a mistake trade, you're kind of like you're trying to force the issue. You're possibly having a perception problem and seeing something that isn't quite there. And you are you have no thought about your future self. Well, that's where acrasia comes in. You're, you're, stealing fr you're actually stealing from your future self if you just kind of wing a trade here i know i'm guilty because i call it like an s and g trade and those add up over time you know 100 here 100 there you lose 100 dollars a day on s and g trade that's 25,000 a year you lose 400 dollars a day on an s and g trade that's 100 grand a year you know it, it starts to add up after a while so one thing i've been thinking about especially if i take an off-the-cuff trade or an s and g trade it doesn't work out i'm like well you know, I need to think about how I'm going to feel before I take that trade next time, as opposed to sweep, sweeping it under the rug. Now, on a must-take trade, if it has a positive outcome, then you will obviously have good feelings, right? That's why we're doing this, right? We want to be, what are we pursuing? We're pursuing happiness. How do we get happiness? Well, there's some Maslow stuff, and I won't go all freshman psychology on you. You know, self-actualization, realization, you know, it's what is it, uh, Wi-Fi, and then air and water, and then it goes up from there. But if you do have a positive outcome from a trade that you had to take, then you have obviously good feelings. And then when you do your post-mortem and you feel really good about everything, there's one more thing you have to do. You have to check your ego to avoid a mistake. Now, I see people all the time just print money, print money, print money, print money, print money, and then they kind of blow up for a while. And why is that? Well, the ego rears its ugly head. So you have to check your ego to avoid a mistake type of trade. Now, Let's suppose a must stake trade results in a negative outcome. Well, that's going to cause what? Frustration. And when you do your post mortem, you have to feel like, you know what? If I saw this trade again tomorrow, and then, you know, I'm talking about the BCLI, even though today I've dropped some meth bombs on that one. We could talk about that one, get the live charts. But I guarantee you, when I went into that trade, and I need to listen to subsequent days. I just grabbed the first day out of my trading service where I talked about it. I'm going to show you what I said. But I'd be willing to bet on subsequent days. At least I know in my head when I saw that one, the LAC was another one that was the same sort of feeling that I had. And those are the only two that really stand out recently. But there's been a few more. But those two just really jumped out at me. And I felt like if I didn't take that trade, I would really hate myself if it took off without me. But on the flip side, and probably just as important, if I took those trades and got stopped out, I would tell myself, you know what, self? 
that was a good looking setup. And if I saw it again tomorrow, I would take it. And that's the other thing too, when you practice deliberate practice, which is another one of those things, it's not enough time. Each one of these topics, we can go into a lot more detail. And I have, just like perception, I have complete presentations just on that. But if you practice deliberate practice, which I've done complete presentations on, and those are behind the firewall in the members area for the gold members, you're looking to get a little better at what you're doing. And in doing those post-mortems, if you see the true enlightenment, at least, is when you see a losing trade, when you're doing a post-mortem or a losing trade and say, you know what, you back that back out to day one when you first saw it. And you say, well, if I saw it to, again tomorrow, then I would take that trade again. And that's when the true enlightenment begins to occur. Now, the mistake trade, again, you have like a little intuition and you're not really time traveling to, into the future. You're not doing that mind sculpting or whatever you want to call it, not to get too esoteric on you, but you're obviously not thinking too much about it. And here's where the danger comes in. If there's a positive outcome, you start feeling pretty good. What has happened? The market is often a bad teacher. It has rewarded bad behavior. So when you do your post-mortem, two things are gonna happen. One, you're gonna say, thank the market gods. What the hell was I thinking? I can't believe I made money on this. I should have gotten crushed on this trade. Well, that's going to put you back up into the upper quadrant of this and into the must take trades and realize that, hey, I picked, use your favorite adage, but I picked up nickels in front of this bulldozer or the trade wasn't worth the risk. However, you want to look at it, it just was uh, choppy or it really wasn't that great of a setup. And that's when you, again, thank the market gods and then work to get into more of those must take trades. Now, let's say you said, I am a market guy, okay? And I see it happen all the time, and I'm as guilty as anyone too. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, that's gonna likely create a negative downward spiral where you're more likely to take the next mistake trade. And a lot of people with this newfound success the you know i pick on the robin hood people but i'm glad robin hood's out there really i'm a, i'm pro robin hood really pro robin hood i just think you have to graduate to something a little bit more professional and people at robin are probably going to be aggravated with me for saying that but i think you set a little bit more professional in time but you got to everybody's got to start somewhere and i think this is great bringing all these new traders into the market but if that market is rewarding that bad behavior, again, you could really end up in that downward spiral. So you have a negative outcome. Let's say you have a negative outcome and you, of course, that's gonna result in frustration. That's a no brainer, right? When you do your post-mortem, you're gonna to come to two conclusions. One, stupid. <laughs> My wife used to have a boss. She was in marketing years ago and she had a boss and every Monday morning, the boss would come in. She had two teenage sons and she would come in and she'd tell a whole story about what the kids did over the weekend. And then she would pause and then she'd say, stupid. So that's stuck with me. So if you're saying, boy, that was stupid. I lost money. At least you learned something from the trade, right? There was something to be learned. Hey, don't do that again. Then you move back up to the top quadrant to the must take trade. And that's the hard part is as long as you recognize what you did was stupid, that's great. And if you lost money on something you should have taken, that's even harder, right? Because you've got that negative reinforcement. Well, Terrence O'Dean said outcomes are noisy and there's a whole bunch of other quotes from him. I think he talks about a lot of uh, outcomes are noisy, market generate a lot of data, a lot of good trades result in bad outcomes, a lot of bad trades result in good outcomes. Annie Duke, Thinking in Bets, that would be a really good book to read, which basically talks about all we're talking about right here, okay? Dealing with the process, make sure you're doing the right process. 
Now, if, and this is kind of along the lines of the Annie Duke book, if in doing your post-mortem on this mistake trade, a trade you should not have taken, and you say, you know what, I was just unlucky. Well, again, that keeps you stuck in this potential negative downward spiral. Now, if you could do all that, plus everything I've said prior, I think 99.8% of the problems will be solved. So a must-take trade, the market obviously needs to be trending. We're trend followers, right? A mistake trade would be choppy or trending in the wrong direction. And we'll take a look at a couple of those in just one second. A uh, must-take trade is, it trades cleanly. It tends to go up day after day after day. And when it pulls back, it pulls back in a very orderly type of fashion. It's team, it tends to be persisting in trend. David Keller, he knows everybody in the world. He talks about one of his mentors said, I like trends that I don't need my glasses to see. So you should be able to just look at a market and know whether or not it's headed up, down, or sideways. And if it's plainly headed higher and persisting in that trend, something like a persistent pullback where it tends to go up day after day after day, you could draw a line through nearly all the bar bars mathematically, that's known as linear regression. But I just like to draw a line through the bars. And then the opposite of that would be trades like an electrocardiogram. It's up, it's down, it's up, it's down. It's kind of a Jackie Mason stock. You can hear the beep, 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 you know. As I've said a thousand times, when the it's kind of yeah, my ego is gonna rear its ugly head here, but when artists sometimes they're interviewed, they they'll say, Hey, the greatest thing is is when the audience sings a song back to me. Hey, you know the song, you know. And I was in Italy and when I was we were looking at charts and uh when we get to a choppy chart, I was asking the audience, you know, what do you think? What do you think? As I'm flipping through a bunch of charts, showing them how I do my nightly analysis. And then, although they didn't understand the language that I was speaking, they had to listen to the translator. As the charts would go up, you'd hear beep, people in the audience would go beep, 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 beep. But it was really cool. Anyway, I'm a nerd. And have an ego, like everyone, I guess. Is it accelerating in trends? Is it doing this? Okay. Or is it doing this? Is the Landry light positive? Very simple way to qualify, not quantify, but qualify trends. Or does it have little or even negative Landry light? And this will make a little more sense when we take a look at example. Is it an obvious setup, okay? Does it jump out at you? And as I've said quite a bit, and going through 2000 stocks every night, I'm begging on that keyboard. I have a foot switch now I use because I have uh, repetitive injuries in both hands and one elbow, and I've already had surgery here. Anyway, I, I actually bang on, I actually hit the, the floor like a um, like a bass drummer. Just, I just hit this little uh, space bar. I don't know what happened if I hit it right now. Let's see. Okay, so I have it disconnected because the webcam's on. But anyway, I'm banging, 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 like the rat going for the cocaine. It's like, and all of a sudden, a stock will jump out of me. I'm like, that's my, that's my setup right there. I'll know it like that. And then I just take the time and go through the rest of them to dot the I's across the T's and make sure there's nothing else. But usually that best setup jumps out at me. The LAC trade, even though it did not work out, although some clients did not do the right thing and allow themselves to be stopped out, they're still in it, doing pretty good. But at least we got the swing trade part out of it. And the BCLI, God, you know, I hope there's that word, hope you should never use, but hopefully it'll work out. But if it doesn't, at least we... We almost got the swing trade part out of it. Now, a lot of times people will send me a chart and ask if it's a, it, it tell me about, hey, I like this stock. I'm like, what's your setup? And it's like, there's no setup in the chart. A lot of times the something is simple. And again, we could boil all these problems down. Or a lot of these things can boil, be boiled down to, I'm gonna say it again, intuition versus intuition. but is the net net significant okay where was the price where is the price and again that's going to make a lot more sense when we pull up a chart or two and that's based on the volatility of the stock okay or is the net net nil has it not gone anywhere in quite a while or worse is it negative so someone brought this up and they're a little newer to my methodology and you know, welcome aboard. And I would never pick on anyone. I kicked one guy out in 20 years from these presentations because he would come in every week and ask about 
stocks. Ah, oh, just demonetized my video. <laughs> I guess I could beep that out tomorrow. But finally, I had to kick him out. You know, he was a pain in the buttocks. So if you're new to the methodology, welcome aboard and just keep an open mind as you learn about this thing called trend. And it doesn't have to be that complicated. I'll give you one pattern of trade here in just one second. You know, what is the one pattern? I think I have the one pattern. But someone was asking about this stock. Well, first of all, let's look at the net net price change, okay? It was up around 13, okay? And then it dropped down to nearly $8 a share. That's $5 a share. And if you measure that on a closing basis, that's a 29% drop. Now, based on the volatility of this stock, that's a pretty substantial drop. If this was a biotech that ran up 200%, and then a 29% correction, that's a whole different story. But in this case, based on the volatility of the stock, that's a big deal. And then let's look at the net net. What did I just say? What about a nil net net, okay, or zero? Well, I'll go all the way back to June, middle of June. And as you can see, you know, where's it now? $8.81. Where was it back two months ago, three months ago? When was June? Oh, it's October. How'd that happen? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> So let's see, one, two, three and a half months ago, it was at what, 881. So it's not a trend. If anything, it looks like it could be in a downtrend, okay? Now, again, I don't think indicators indicate anything. I think they're more illustrating. Illustrators, they show you what's in the chart. But I've been having a lot of fun. I know you're a part of it with me probably, right? <laughs> Playing around with these Landry Light and proper order indicators from stock charts. And these are free. If you're watching a YouTube video, just like the video or leave a comment and you'll get the indicators for free. I can't help you with your subscription. I do not get compensated for the plugin. It's free, so there is no compensation. But if I can help people, that makes me feel good. And maybe they'll be interested in something else that I do. And that would be great with me. But you can see Landry Light was red, meaning that the highs, as you can see, and a chart above or below, in this particular case, my favorite lately has been that 30-day EMA. Now, this is something that somebody was thinking about buying. And then after a little bit of a kiss, notice that they went red again. Now, if we take a look at the bow tie moving averages, 10 simple, 20 exponential, 30 exponential, notice that the 10 was above the 20 and the 20 was above the 30 for a long, long time. And if you look at the bottom chart here, you can see as long as it's green, you have upside Landry light. When it's yellow, those moving averages are beginning to intersect, okay? So what I like about this little proper order indicator that the guy programmed for me is that it kind of gives you green light, yellow light, red light. Now it's not always that simple, but sometimes it can be, okay? as you can see here. So now we have the 10 below the 20 and the 20 below the 30. So we have downtrend proper order. Never say never, but I doubt seriously, eh, there might be one case or two cases, but I doubt it. I doubt seriously, unless something's like going straight up and had a really deep correction really fast. I know like a first deep retracement an IPO would probably do a downside uh, Landry uh, proper order. But I would say in most cases, especially if you're new to trading, don't trade any pullbacks that are in downtrend proper order. And that, that might save you a lot of trouble in and of itself. So see, look, there's one little rule I just kind of backed into by accident, okay? Don't trade any pullbacks that are in downtrend proper order. Well, that would eliminate this particular stock here he was thinking about trading, okay? Now, this is a must-take trade. This is a BCLI I talked about earlier, okay? Now I went in and listened to what I said. Now here's the thing, you can time travel as far as what I'm saying, okay? Go in and say, well, what was Dave saying on, this is actually published on August 1st, okay? I published the night before, so tomorrow's service is, tonight's will be labeled 10-2, even though it's published on 10-1 because it's 4, 10, 2. But anyway, 
long story endless, I played it and it said very, 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 I said very three times, nice persistent trend followed by a very orderly pullback, a little bit of a knockout move, like a little bit of a TK move, TKO move in the last bar. So I like that. And this, this is an exact quote, and I should probably go in and listen to the other things that I said about it on subsequent days. This was the recommendation, BCLI, 1410, 1070, 1750, 340 for the entry, protective stop, initial profit target, and risk, respectively. And I had it as a pullback. It's also a Landry Light pullback. So what do we have? We have a big blue arrow pointing higher. We have Landry Light for a long, 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 long time. Pulls back to the what? To the moving average down here. That is a good looking setup, okay? And notice the persistent trend. As a general statement, it tends to go up day after day after day. It corrects a little bit here and there, which is fine, but after correction, it tends to go right back up. And again, it kisses the moving average, which is illustrated in the bottom. So entry was here. Stop was down here, and the initial profit target was up here. And I'll follow up on this one. And other ones mentioned recently, either either in this show or in my stock chart show. I've been walking, doing a lot of walkthroughs on the setups just to get everybody up to speed in the, in the trading simplified shows. And these shows, I can get into a little bit more advanced concepts. Random thoughts on these and other trading problems. I talked about this last week. The good news is you know what you're doing wrong. I've had, without going into a lot of details, I've many clients contact me over the years. I look at what they're doing. I tell them what they're doing wrong. And what do they say? I know, I know. Again, garbage in, garbage out. Work hard to get better at what you're doing. We're all going to have some stinker trades. You're going to have a lot of stinker trades in the future, okay? But learn from them. What you want is usually not what is, and you have to live with that. Good luck. Well, that that kind of speaks volumes for like once you're in a trade, okay? I hate to use the word hope, but I'm hoping that this BCLI does hit that initial profit target to take off because it's a wonderful example of being underwater in a trade. And I think LEC was the same thing, although it eventually stopped out. So it's better than the Pokemon I trade, but I think the BCLI could turn into a really fantastic example because it was underwater for a while, quite a while, and then finally took off. And I know a lot of people gave up on it. I'm not gonna quit you. <laughs> just just talk to the charts, you know? I ain't gonna quit you. Postmortems again are key. Postmortems can, pre-mortems, I should say, could save your buttocks, time travel. Okay, if I take this little intraday trade and lose my ass on it, how will I feel? It's like, well, I'm gonna feel pretty stupid. And a little hard to kind of do all of that, okay? But if you can, you'll do fantastic. Acrasia is the bitch. Acrasia is like putting something off that you should do. And acrasia is often defined as stealing from your future self. And I forget his name. But he's uh, somebody who talks a lot about habits. I think the guy who wrote Atomic Habits Habits talks a lot about Acrasia. And Acrasia, I think according to him, I can't think of his name right now, but the book's Atomic Habits. And it's not about, for him, I think he said, it's not about so much about making bad habits hard. It's about making good habits easy. And there are different ways you could you could do both of those, make a bad habit hard or a, a good habit easy and it all boils down to something as simple as a commitment device and i think the example i gave last week was i was in an intraday trade and i was very tempted to micromanage myself out of the trailing stop and just cash out and i said you know what i'm just going to walk into the house and have lunch or visit with the wife a little bit and when i came back not all the time but this time in particular i would have really cut myself short because this trade ran for a lot longer. So there's different commitment devices. I think last week I talked about the doctor who has his, he did it again recently too. Uh, and he actually had it changed for a few days because 
He was doing a lot of day trading. He was doing incredibly well day trading. And then he kind of sort of taking the mediocre setups, kind of going back to that perception thing earlier. It kind of went to his head a little bit. So he knew he needed a break. So he actually handed his phone to the secretary. She changed his password, gave it back to him on his trading account. So now he has to go through a phone broker and he's not going to make 200 trades a day with the phone broker. All right. So I think everybody here that is gold is already in Facebook. If you're not, I'm going to probably bug you a little bit to get into the Facebook group because it's been really, really good. And I learned a lot. I get a lot of good setups from it. And you guys are just been awesome. And as I've said a thousand times, you, know, you get involved with these forums, even professional forums. And I, I don't want to say who's forum, but it's, uh, if I said the name, you would know him if you've been trading for more than a day. And I was part of his forum for a while. It, it just became Lord of the Flies so quick. Most of these forums do. But so far, knock on wood, we've been fantastic with our forum. And it's free, 100% free. And it's a it's an added benefit. And I pop in there several times a day. I do a lot of lurking too, just FYI. And you guys do such a good job interacting. A lot of times I feel like there's no need for me to chime in. I don't want to come in as the grand Pumba and comment on everything. But when I feel like a comment is worth making, I will. Anyway, you can interact with other traders. You can ask for help. And this is what I've been blown away by. And thank you guys and girls here tonight who have helped out the other traders. And, and you know, what a great, what a great bunch I have. It really is. It's been exciting. Um, how do I say this? Uh, Charlie Kirk has a great group of, of people. In fact, a lot of people in this group are from Charlie Kirk's group too. And I remember thinking, it's like, how do I get a group of people like that? And that is what this, this uh, group in Facebook has become. And I don't want to get all sappy on you, but I'm, I'm really excited about it. Anyway, every now and then I'll throw some uh, trades out there and some other things. Let me shift gears here. You shift gears. If you guys want to ask about anything, Quiet, uh, quiet bunch tonight. But if you want to start asking about individual issues while I get my charts shared, feel free to do so now. And then I'm going to go through just a just a few charts really quick on the overall market, and then we'll do the stock picks. All right, let me get this shared. Lord, are you in the group tonight, or you? Uh, I see I'm getting a Facebook message from you. You forgot to sign in. Anybody from down under tonight? Yeah, oh, goody, okay. Forgot to join at nine. <laughs> hey, we got Laura, we got Barry. All right, we've got uh, Brisbane and, is are you both from Brisbane? I know one of you guys is from Melbourne. I said that right. <laughs> I'm here now, love the topic of the mistake. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. Barry's in Melbourne, that's right. Okay, uh, S&P 500, and we can pull up the uh, ACP in a minute, but you can see as of today, it has Landry Light, one bar, but one bar of Landry Light above the 30-day EMA, and you can't see the 20s right underneath it. So these moving averages could be in uptrend proper order soon, okay? I'm doing a good job in the Melbourne. Melbourne? <laughs> You just kind of have you kind of have to cut it off. As you can see, a little bit of a range though, 3,200, 3,400 and change ish. And I'm encouraged by the market action, but I'm still seeing quite a few shorts. And that's got me a little concerned. If you look at the Landry list tonight, and if you don't have access, wait about a week and then you can go in and look at it and you'll see what I'm saying. There's quite a few shorts and it has me a little concerned. I've got to always be careful when my own personal portfolio gets whacked. And, and this does show some things, actually. Of course, I did get whacked on a short today. Maybe that's most of the pain. I'll have to look at it. But usually when the momentum stocks get hit pretty hard, like I trade, usually sometimes within a few days, you see some sort of corrective action in the overall market. Back years ago, it was a lot of work. And I really miss it, though. It was something fantastic. I should probably hire somebody on and do it again. But I used to keep what I call the Landry 100. And all that was was 100 momentum stocks that are making new highs with a bit of vigor and decent volume stocks. So you could actually say that you could trade them. And the hypothetical portfolio was 10 grand in every stock. And this system, so to speak, absolutely printed money in trending markets and trending markets that were following through. 
And obviously in non-trending markets, it didn't do so well, but I did treat ass, uh, uh, almost, almost said ass, <laughs> ass as an asset class, cash as an asset class, looks like more demonetization is coming up, it's gonna happen. But I treated cash as an asset class, so it wasn't always 100 stocks in the portfolio. Anyway, long story endless, one thing I saw with that, one of the biggest revelations was that thing would get whacked like three or 4%, okay? And for some reason, the 3.84% comes out and stands out in my mind. I think that was one of the days it got whacked. I'm like, ouch, that was painful. And uh, lo and behold, within two or three days, the overall market tanked a little bit. So I do maintain momentum lists and that would be a good way of kind of uh, getting a feel for things. NASDAQ Composite doing okay in here. Notice the moving averages are back in uptrend, proper order. Oh, I was wrong about that. The 20 is back above the 30, which is a good thing, but the 10 hasn't caught up just yet, but it will soon if we stay up here. We're taking out this recent resistance here, so that looks pretty darn good. Russell 2000 back above its moving averages. Nothing magical about that, but it does give you a, a little bit of a reference point. Still has to get through this overhead supply. Now, one thing I find kind of interesting is take a look at silver, the commodity, and it's actually set up as a short going into tomorrow. Take a look at CEF, which a good friend of mine used to be on the board of this company, I think. And he's no longer with us, unfortunately. He was kind of my canary in a coal mine. He would, he would, he drank coffee like crazy, smoked cigarettes like crazy. And uh, he didn't drink a lot of beer, but he drank a significant amount of beer. And I'm like, that's my canary in a coal mine. You know, if, if this guy could could act like that, and then then I'm gonna be just fine. And then he croaked, and I'm like, damn it. <laughs> I gotta stop drinking. Yeah. Anyway, notice this physical gold. Okay, nice little bow tie down off of not quite all time highs, but very significant highs. All time highs for this instrument, I do believe, for this ETF. Don't quote me on that. Nope, not quite. Okay, I didn't think it was. But anyway, so gold not doing so good, silver not doing so good. The actual commodity that is. Let's take a look at the gold stocks. As you can see, kind of rolling over a little bit with them. I got quite a few gold stocks in my land you list tonight. I'm a little leery about short and gold. But I was thinking earlier, it's like, you know, given the situation in the world, how could you short gold? It's like, oh God. But that's what is happening. So if I might actually have to short some gold stocks in here or even physical gold and silver, depending on what happens. And if we can get back above these moving averages in the stocks and then the hard commodities, then we may have dodged a bullet. But that's a little bit concerning. Silver, same thing, very similar pattern there, bow tied to the downside. Some areas in here doing okay. Retail looking like they're trying to get back above here. Carol, yeah, Carol, you were a bull when I was uh, somewhat bullish on silver a while back. And then now uh, I'm proud of you. You're looking to be a bear. Yeah, I, I'd say 21 would be a good entry on that. If you wanted to take a short term, ter term trade, lots of Freudian slips tonight, huh? ZSL, don't stick with it too long though, okay? Because this is, uh, these these inverted shares have a really bad tracking error, but you, you've got a cup and handle, you're gonna have a bow tie soon. You know, maybe above 10 and change, maybe 10.25 here. And just don't don't overstay your welcome because longer term, they all go to zero, these inverted shares, that is. So a lot of sectors, like the overall market, kind of mixed throughout. Software is trying to get it back in gear. Again, it made it past these prior highs. The bow tie moving average is still down in downtrend proper order, but they are trying to turn back up. And, you know, just kind of go through the sectors at your leisure. And you'll see that some are doing okay and some are kind of lagging a little bit, obviously. It's not like they're all going up. Drugs kind of stalled out a little bit today. Drugs, which were outperforming biotech not too long ago, or now underperforming biotech. And look at biotech. So biotech rolled over. And that was another one of those areas I just didn't want to short, okay? And I'm not confusing the issue with facts, but it just seems like there's so many biotechs right now that are so volatile. It's just not worth going after as a short. I'd rather short something that's a big stodgy company that when it rolls over, everybody's gonna run to the door at the same time. All right, let's do some individual stocks. Mike says XER, 
XERS. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Um, let's start with a blank chart. Uh, tons and tons and tons of overhead supply. I would immediately throw that out, okay? Based on that. As always, thanks for the, all the hard work you put in for your members. You're welcome, Mike. I appreciate that. Checks in the mail. <laughs> Thank you, man. Yeah, too much overhead supply on that one. I think that we could probably find something better than that. F. Now, this is all over the place. Who asked that? Don? Don? I think it was you that I kicked out a while back. You know, what's your net net price on this thing? Uh, not much, 4% a couple of months. And if you go over to, let's go to July, let's see where we were. You know, unless you want to short it, but it's it's not a decent setup. Don's back. What what is it with Don and that and that? It's not. How do I kick him out? It's been so long since they had to kick him out. Let's kick out Don. All right. Let's see. You should not ask about a trend non-trending stock once you know what you're doing. Hey, I see we have the uh, psychiatrist I talked about. Hey, welcome psychiatrist. I can't. I'm not gonna say your name. <laughs> what a courtesy. Yeah, let me just kick Don out. You know, he knows better. He should know better. Then we can get uh, busy again. All right, let's see. Don, you have been dismissed. Let's see. Mute him. How do I get him? It's been so long. All right, Don's been dismissed. Yep, bye, Don. All right, Don's back. <laughs> he keeps it interesting, doesn't he? Asking about crappy side. Yep, Don's gone. Grand opening, grand closing. <laughs> Sorry to waste your time with that. Yeah, take a look at this thing. Uh, you know, it's buy at B, but it's it's well over thirty dollars a share. Let's throw in the five day. Thank you. We're back to trend following again. Fantastic. Okay. Let's throw in a five day simple moving average. Oh, it won't work because we don't have enough data. Um, I would pass just because it's above thirty, and uh, it's just. I would prefer to buy something under 20. Now I have been a little bit more lenient buying things at like 25 and things like that lately, but it looks good. And I think what I'll do with this one is I'll just wait for the first pullback and then look to get long. But yeah, uh, Donald, not Don, good job. Okay, TGB I did have as a buy signal. Now TGB goes against, goes against, um, what I was saying earlier about um, the metals, okay? But I like the setup. And if you go back and look at the archives on 923, I fleshed out a lot of this stuff, but you can see this is a nice sell off here. That looked really good, but now it's kind of like, it's a little bit different. This is why I took it off the service. I don't like the action in the metals overall. And then when you have a TKO, I like to see them come back, back up here and take out that TKO bar as quickly as possible. So the combination of the fact that it hasn't done that yet and the combination it's also metal. If this was any other stock, I'd say, well, let's give it the benefit of the doubt, maybe still try to play that TKO, but I'm gonna pass for now. LE, got in the laundry list due to bow ties. Okay. Yeah, this looks okay. It's a little on the thin side, but it's lands in. It should be tradable. Um, it does have a little bad memories, but those are a long ways away. This is not bad. So yeah, this is okay. I mean, it, it has lost. It has lost. Um, oops, I've got fingers some stuff. It has lost some steam as of late, but overall, it still looks pretty good. So I'm, I'm going to give you a high five on that one. Um, just make sure you wait for an entry. Don Wilson has left. Yeah, we kick you out. <laughs> yeah, I like this a lot. Uh, it needs a little bit more pullback, okay? Um, yeah, I think the, the people at Stock Charts have been trying to get me on this Unity thing, but um, I don't need it anymore because my shows are recorded. They used to be live. I mean, they were live. I think Unity has something to do with the communication of the cell phone. Not a confuse issue with facts. I like to see this uh, pull back a little bit further in here but i mean it's it's kind of crazy because it's taken off so much it's already pulled back kind of deeply it looks okay 
Top I like. Top's in the Landry list tonight. I'm actually recommending no stocks for tomorrow. That's why I can talk about some of these. But uh, yeah, I think it looks pretty good. I think it's viable. You know, maybe 23 liberal entry, 2250, a little more aggressive. And believe it or not, stop way down here at like 1750. Look at the HV on that. That's Tupperware. How crazy is that? Arch. Yeah, this one looks fantastic. Uh, volume a little on the thin side, but not too bad. Now, the only thing is it is a metals and mining. Okay, it does have some bad supply, uh, bad supply, overhead supply or bad memories back here. And that's a ways away. I guess if it made it all the way to 70, I'd be pretty happy. So I think that looks pretty good, especially if you zoom it in a little bit. My only concern is we need to find out what kind of metals and mining they're doing, industrial metals and minerals, because gold and silver is not doing so well right now. This is this LAC, and this is where the market sometimes reward bad, rewards bad behavior. I got stopped out right around here, a little bit lower, because I was using a little discretion. And we got, and this was another one of those stocks where I said, this thing looks fantastic. If it doesn't work, I don't care. You know, and it's hard. I mean, I'm still gonna drop an F-bomb, but it looked pretty good. Notice the uh, trends pulls back, trends pulls back, rinses and repeats. Took off really nicely, unfortunately shook us out and then it took off again. So that's the one I wanted to mention. That's the one where you were underwater for what, a week and a half? Questioned your sanity by sitting through it, but that was a thing to do. CMPS, CMPS. Yeah, this looks really good too. I like that you guys are all over these IPOs. Tiny bit more deep retracement, just a little bit more would be nice, okay? Uh, maybe a little bit below 32, but it looks pretty darn good. I'm gonna have to give you a high five on that one. Whoever gave us that, was that John? CTRA, CT, I gotta stop deleting them until I cover them. Yeah, this looks pretty good too. Um, kind of thin, you know, a hundred and something thousand shares. But you know, the beauty of this thing is that this is like a Phoenix type of uh, stock. It does have some bad memories. I don't really like this gap, but that was, that was a ways ago. But yeah, I'll give you a high five on that one. OSTK, that's gotta be a short, right? You wouldn't wanna buy that, would you? Um, too many days in the pullback. That's why I took it off the Landry list. But let's throw like a bow tie in there. And it's still kind of, you can see it bow tied down. Not a great setup there. But if you back the chart out a couple of weeks, it looks great. But now it's just too many days in the, um, too many days going sideways in here. So I'd pass on that one. All right, any more? <laughs> I'm glad to see a lot of you old timers in here uh, recognizing Don. <laughs> I'm not always mean, but you can't keep asking about a stock that's not trending. We're trend followers, right? Well, look, looks like I'm pretty much out of time. I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time on a busy schedule. I had a lot of fun tonight. I hope you did too. And any unanswered questions, bring them up in the Facebook group. If you're not, in Facebook group, feel free to add, uh, ask a uh, question down below in the YouTube comments. Like the video if you don't mind. And hopefully I'll see all you guys and girls again next week. We don't talk to you now and then. Everybody have a fantastic weekend. Thank you so much.